Well, looks like it's time to review some more Modern Horizons goodness and probably some badness too. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles, and welcome to the newest installment of my Modern Horizons set review. And this is an exciting one because I was right. We will talk about what I was right on when we get to the card. Let's just dive, let's just dive right into the fun. Starting out with Archmage's Charm. Three blue gets you an instant that allows you three different options. You can either counter target spell, target player draws two cards, or gain control of target non-land permanent with converted mana cost one or less. In all honesty, this seems like a pretty good card. You have three different options here. It's a hard counter. It'll let you draw cards at instant speed and even take control of a permanent. Admittedly, it is a cheap permanent you can take control of, but it feels like um it feels like a mini a mini variation of cryptic command, honestly to me. And the artwork, unlike Umazawa's charm, actually looks like a genuine charm. You can see what is supposed the charm in the middle with blue kind of magic rippling out from it and around it you have fire magic that's kind of all arcing around and I imagine that this is the charm actually countering a fire spell that that's what it looks like to me is being depicted in the artwork this is most likely repurposed artwork but it actually fits it feels just fine there's nothing about it that goes and eh, this doesn't fit together so this seems like a decent rare to me not too shabby let us move on We've got a really interesting one next. Fallen Shinobi. It's a zombie ninja. Doesn't that, it sounds like something you would see in like a, like a schlock film, like some B movie, right? But it's an interesting card. One black, one blue, three colorless gets you a 5-4. So 5-4, it's a pretty beefy ninja. It's got ninjutsu for two colorless, a blue and a black. If you guys don't know what ninjutsu is, you return an unblocked attacker you control to your hand and put this card on the battlefield from your hand tapped and attacking so basically after the declare blockers step then you can decide to swap that for a creature that didn't end up being blocked you can't choose to do that before the uh the blocking phase because it's not considered unblocked until after you go past declare blockers but at that point you can swap out a creature you're already attacking with and just go boom and this comes straight into play ready to attack gets to hit the opponent and you get the ability of the ninja. In this case, it's whenever Fallen Shinobi deals combat damage to a player, that player exiles the top two cards of their library. Until end of turn, you may play those cards without paying their mana costs. How insane is that? You get to exile two cards off your opponent's deck, and you get to play them for free. You get to play two spells off your opponent's deck with this. This thing is berserk. It's going in the king cube, it's awesome. And I actually really like the artwork. It does have like, you look at the back, on its back, it's got a, um, it's got a katana, so it feels like it's coming from the world of Kamigawa where we did indeed find ninjas. I like the idea of like, it's a zombie, right? So its flesh is gonna be rotting away. And to me, that's what that metal grafted hand on there is for. It's like, okay, its flesh is failing it but it ends up grafting or like strapping a metal hook onto its hand and a weird flat climbing gun hook so that it can still be a stealthy ninja. And the idea of a zombified ninja is interesting on multiple levels because it's a huge contrast between a zombie and a ninja. When you think of zombie, you think slow, shambling, noisy, groaning. And when you think of a uh, ninja, you think like quick, nimble, agile, and silent. So there's a massive, massive difference between the two, but it's mashed together in a way that actually kind of feels like it works. I mean, this looks like a ninja that's like hanging on a windowsill or a balcony that's gonna pull itself up, flip over it, and just be like, slap down with its sword, take somebody out, and then disappear into the night. And people are like, wait, was that a zombie? And I mean, if you think about it, ninjas are scary enough, but a, like as a zombie, you could just run it through and it would just stand there like, it's not gonna do it, son. I'm a zombie. I'm already dead. So this is cool. This is a flavorful card. I dig it. Next up, we've got Farmstead Gleaner. This card is underwhelming, to say the least. Three mana for a 2-2 Scarecrow. It doesn't untap during your untap step. Pay two mana, untap it, 
put a plus one plus one counter on farmstead gleaner so if for those of you who aren't familiar with it that's what that weird swirly symbol is headed in the other direction that's the untapped symbol and i really liked it when they invented the untapped symbol i think my favorite untapped cards are hate flare and pure sight marrow because pure sight marrow can be used in a really dirty combo but yeah I, i'm a big fan of the untapped symbol the flavor text says when it finishes the harvest you'll have nowhere to hide so i mean the the flavor behind it i mean you look at the artwork it definitely looks like a scarecrow out in the fields the idea that it doesn't untap it's just some some it, requ it requires you keep feeding man into it to animate it it's got a brass man kind of feel in the whole doesn't untap pay the mana to untap it but it is obviously more versatile than something like a brass man overall this is an underwhelming uncommon but it is interesting and the flavor of it the artwork and the card ties together nicely which is good to see because there's a bunch of cards in the set that really don't make me feel that way Next up, we've got another sliver. There are a lot, a lot of slivers in this set. One red, two colors for a 2-2 sliver. Sliver creatures you control have tap, discard a card, draw a card. It's, it seems pretty crazy. Now, just so you understand, the discard a card comes before the colon. So this isn't an ability where you have a situation where you can just go, oh, I can tap this when I have no cards in my hand and I'll get to draw a card. Discarding the card is part of the cost, and that is obviously required because otherwise this thing would be insane. All slivers would just have, I'm going to draw like a fiend, and that, that would be too powerful. But still, this ability to filter your draws by tapping all your different slivers, it feels like it has a real potential. It's interesting that this shows up on a red card. Back in the day, this would have been considered more of a blue ability, a la Merfolk Looter, but red is slowly but surely getting more cards like this more along the lines of faithless looting. The flavor text says, brilliant. They evolved away from energy taxing brains and respond only to spinal reflex arcs from the hive mind. And that's a quote from Ruka Rumel Field Journal. I like that, honestly, the idea of studying them and realizing these things don't actually have a brain. They literally just have spinal reflexes. That's funky. That's a cool concept for a sliver. And I really like this artwork, honestly. I like that it's up on some like mountain peak, just kind of swirled above it. You can see all the mountains in the background. This looks like you would be standing somewhere on like a cliff or a mountaintop with an absolutely beautiful view as the sun is setting or possibly rising. I'm not 100% sure, uh, but it is, it is a nice look. It feels like a sunset to me, but it's a beautiful looking card. I, I definitely like it. And it feels like a solid sliver. This one I have no flavor issues with. Next, we've got King of the Pride, a nice lion. One white, two colors for a 2-1 cat. Other cats you control get plus two, plus one. That's a beefy boost, in all honesty. That is a beefy boost. Glorious to walk again across the savannah with my beloved. Love song of night and day. So that's a nod to the old Mirage block. Now, this card makes me think of a few different things. It makes me think of an old school savannah lion from the beginning of Magic. And the plus two plus one on a three cost white card makes me think of the old magic card Jihad. So this this is an interesting one. And honestly, it's a nice include for cat tribal decks. All in all, I mean, he doesn't look that super impressive in all honesty to be like, I boost up other lions, but it's serviceable. It works with the artwork. It is definitely a nice looking lion there. But overall, the artwork is kind of like, eh, okay. But overall, the card's like, hell yeah, as an, as an uncommon this one's pretty good. Next up, we've got a really disappointing card to me. Nature's Chant, a one green slash white and one colorless, so that's a hybrid mana and a colorless. Uh, destroy target artifact or enchantment at instant speed. The flavor text is jank. Plant every sword, embrace every soul. That's terrible. Plant every sword. Somebody thought that was clever. Like somebody looked at it, was like, look, he's turning the sword into a tree as we've done on a bunch of like naturalized style cards. Why don't I say plant every sword? Like, that's that's a terrible quote. That's a terrible quote. This feels like it's repurposed artwork from the new Ravnica set, actually. Take a look at it. We've got Celestia going on here. We've got this this sword being turned. It's it's basically your your naturalize. Essentially, it's a naturalize. And in the back, you can see it's even autumn in Ravnica. So this is this to me 
just feels like something that's actually from the current block artwork that they had kicking around and they used it and they put it on this jank card that's supposed to be a nod to naturalize and disenchant mating but honestly it's pretty underwhelming i'm not i'm not impressed by the card the artwork is the artwork's actually all right i like the artwork but the artwork is taken down a notch for me by the stupid flavor text plant every sword I'm gonna plant your sword. It's like, no, I'm gonna plant my sword in your eye for saying such dumb nonsense. Next up, Orcish Hellraiser. This guy's pretty solid. One red, one colorless for a three, two orc, and it has echo for one red. Now echo is an old school ability you would have seen back in the day of the Urza block. And how echo works is you have to pay the echo cost the turn after the card comes into play. If you don't then the card gets sent to the graveyard. You have to sacrifice it if you don't pay the echo cost. So you have to pay two mana to put this guy out at first, and then you have to pay one mana the next turn to keep him. But I like the way that it plays around with the echo cost, saying when the Orcish Hellraiser goes to the graveyard, it deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. So you can put it out and decide, you know what, I actually don't want to have it around. I'm going to redirect this two damage to a player or planeswalker. It would be stronger if it hit a creature, but that might also make it too strong. This card's okay, but I like the creative use of Echo, and the artwork works. You've got you've got the Hellraiser charging in, and the burning stuff in the background can easily represent the two damage that he deals when you let him go. So overall, the flavor of this card is tied together pretty nicely. This doesn't feel as bad as some of the commons from the set, so I'll give it a pass. It doesn't feel like it's quite strong enough for modern, but could turn out to be wrong on that one. Moving on, what do we have next? Oh, we've got a reprint, Pillage. Two red and a colorless, it's a sorcery. Destroy target artifact or land, it can't be regenerated. This card was originally created in alliances with artwork from Richard Kane Ferguson, one of my absolute most favorite magic artists. The flavor text says, the ember of our homes still smolder and already the villages of Keljor burn in retaliation. What they have started, we will finish. And this shows you the strength of old school land destruction. They don't make cards like this anymore, where for three mana, you can destroy an artifact or a land. I like how it has the weird, it can't be regenerated clause. There are very few artifacts or lands that could regenerate in the first place, but Pillage says, no, we're leveling this, burning it down to ashes. I mean, pillaging it kind of makes you think like, I've always thought of pillaging as you actually like get the, um, like get loot as well, and there's no loot getting in this, so it's always been a bit of a, a flavor curiosity, but the artwork for this is great. I love the darkened figure who's kind of purplish in the foreground, and in the back, you can see a fort or a city on fire. The tower is just, just burning away. Looks great. And honestly, it feels like a strong enough card that you could screw around with this in modern. Next up, we've got a really cool card, Plague Engineer. One black, two colors for a 2-2. Two, two. This is a carrier type creature. This is a Phyrexian we're dealing with. It's got Death Touch. As Plague Engineer enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures of the chosen type your opponents control get minus one, minus one. The lasting effects are invariably fatal. Phyrexian progress notes. And this is actually obviously built off of the whole Engineered Plague card from back in the day. So it's a nice nod to that in terms of ability and casting cost, but it's on a really solid body and, and the Plague Engineer is able to engineer a plague in a way where it only negatively affects your opponent's creatures. So if you happen to have the same creature types, they are safe against that. And I like that, that's a nice little touch. The artwork shows what clearly looks like a Phyrexian and what clearly looks like a bunch of noxious plague kind of flowing around. So this is, this is a well put together card. Whether this is repurposed artwork or not, this is well done. It's nice to see the Phyrexians. It's a nice nod to the old school cards for people like me. After that, we've got Scuttling Sliver. It almost doesn't even feel like a sliver when you look at the artwork, but it does have that front spike. So it does get a pass. It does have the beak, nose, and the spike. It's just, it's a sliver trilobite. How funky is that? So one blue, two colors for a two-two. It's a trilobite. Sliver creatures you control have two untap this creature a living fossil active after aeons of dormancy that's interesting it's a really old sliver that's just like almost half fossilized that just awakens due to maybe some climate shift or something and it comes out and it shares its hive mind ability it's it's funky i mean it's it's okay i don't 
I don't feel like this is one of the strongest slivers I've ever seen. There are definitely stronger slivers in this set, some of which we'll talk about, but aren't in this video yet because I'm only using cards that have been spoiled with quality images. So there are some cards we've seen on the spoilers where they're like on a skew and the, and the artwork's a bit faded out and everything, but we're not gonna talk about those or review them until we can get a good addition to look at. Next up, we've got a really fun card. Sling Gang Lieutenant. One black, three colorless for a goblin that is 1-1. One, one. When it enters the battlefield, you create two 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens, sacrifice a goblin, target player loses one life, and you gain one life. Now, this is obviously a play on Siege Gang Commander. This is Siege Gang Lieutenant. This would be the lieutenant to the commander, and obviously, with all the goblin tokens you could get from combining them, this gives you a lot of versatility, and the flavor text is fun too. Freshly promoted to first rock, Zaz was eager to make an impact. That is, that is fun. Honestly, you take a look at the artwork. You have the Sling Gang Lieutenant who's smiling as they pull back the slingshot. You have this little, this little goblin who's in the sling like, yeah, let's do this with his little bladed sword. Here I come. That's fun. He's promoted to first rock. I really like the concept behind that where it's like the rank is, I'm first rock, you're only second rock. I'm gonna get slung at the opponent first. And it's like, with absolutely no care for their own existence. Look at the joy on first rock's face. This is a really cute and fun card. I'm a big fan of this one. Next up, we've got Spring Bloom Druid. One green, two colors for a one one. When Spring Bloom Druid enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice a land. If you do, search your library for up to two basic land cards, put them onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Flavor text says, new growth applies a healing poultice to wounds long scabbed over. So this is an interesting concept. It is akin to the Harrow card, where you sacrifice a land to get two lands. In the artwork, we can see a forest that's been entirely burned down, and from it, new vibrant life is being spewed forth by the druid. So the flavor of this is all tied together nicely. Honestly, he doesn't really look like an elf. I can't really see if his ears are pointed, but he actually looks like a human to me. But either way, that's a really minor nitpick. This is a perfectly serviceable common. It's nothing too exciting, but it's something I would throw into a green tower deck to get more land grab. Next up, we have a card that was most likely originally supposed to be a Hydra, but got repurposed into an incredible enchantment. One green, two colorless. When you cast a permanent spell with a mana cost that contains X, double the value of X. So if you played a spell that was like one green and three for the X, all of a sudden it would double the X to six. That's like amazing. Oh, I'll just double my Genesis wave, no problem. That's awesome. And that's not all. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell or activate an ability, if that spell's mana cost or that ability's activation cost contains X, copy that spell or ability, you may choose new targets for the copy. So permanents get the X doubled, and instants of sorceries or activated abilities get an extra copy of them put on the stack. This card is insane. This card is nuts. This is going to be a casual favorite for a very long time. I don't know if it has what it takes to um, to like really make it into modern and make a big splash in tournaments, but the power level on this feels like it might. But either way, this is going to be a commander favorite, a, a, like a kitchen top casual table tabletop favorite. Honestly, I trip over my words at the power level is. The artwork shows hydras with their like or one gigantic hydra with a ton of heads and a dude facing off against it. It's good artwork and it does kind of tie into the ability because hydras tend to have X in their casting costs, but it really does feel like repurposed artwork. And I mean, Unbound, Unbound Flourishing, sure, you look at the name, it looks like that Hydra is flourishing quite a bit. And it might, the green nodules that we're seeing might actually be gigantic plants flourishing as well. So the artwork does fit to a degree. But the card itself is wow, just wow. After that, we've got, speaking of wow, Winds of Abandon. This card feels strong. One white, one colorless. Exile target creature you don't control. For each creature exiled this way, its controller searches a library for a basic land card. Those players put those cards onto the battlefield tap. 
then shuffle the libraries. Kind of has that settle the wreckage feel, especially once you get to the overload where you can pay six mana and you will exile every creature on the board that you don't control. Doesn't matter how many people you're playing with, exile all of their creatures and they can search for basic lands. This feels like it's going to rip up Commander. It feels like, like you know how Cyclonic Rift is dirty good when you overload it? It's just like, this card is berserk. Winds of Abandon has a similar feel of, wow, this is overpowered. And everybody, everybody turning to like rose petals like this has a very path to exile feel, which is really what this card is doing, right? It's, uh, it's like a path to exile, but on a larger scale. And it, there's definitely a poetic beauty to everybody basically being turned into just beautiful petals and them all drifting along on the wind. So overall, this card is well put together. The whole thing fits together really well. I like it a lot. And last but not least, we have the card I was right about. We got a Tree Folk Planeswalker! Oh yeah, and man, this one seems pretty powerful. One green, one red. It's only two to put out. It's got three loyalty, plus one ability, return up to one target land from your graveyard to your hand, minus one ability, red and six deals one damage to any target, minus seven, you gain an emblem with instants and sorcery cards in your graveyard have retrace. And if you don't know how retrace works, retrace lets you discard a land from your hand to cast a retrace card. So you still have to pay its casting cost and everything, but uh, it kind of, it's almost, it's almost like, um, it's almost like jumpstart in a way, but you can only discard lands to it. That's that's pretty much how it works, except when you retrace, the spell doesn't get exiled. So you can keep retracing over and over, and that ties in really well with the plus one ability. If you keep this around, you can keep getting cards back from your graveyard and recasting the spells in your graveyard, the instants and sorceries that now have retrace. So red and six has some pretty awesome power level to it for the mana you're spending. Now, if you look at the type line, it says Legendary Planeswalker Ren, and that is because Ren is the main focus of this. To me, you have to understand, the information given to us about this is very minimal. It was posted on Star City Games, and the guy who spoiled this card did not do a very good job of explaining the flavor or really under... Like, basically, he just went, Ren is, Ren is bound into this tree folk, and it's the sixth tree folk. That's why he's called Six, and... He's like a mech-like thing for him to walk around in. That was basically the flavor. And that feels really weak to me because it seems like there's so much potential for more here. There's a lot of interesting action going on here. Is this a fire mage that's been bound into a tree folk that's taken over a tree folk? Is this a dryad that somehow has been infused with fire magic and has been driven somewhat mad? How does the tree folk itself feel about the fact that it has fire magic flowing through it when fire is anathema to tree folk, right? Tree folk are going to be terrified of fire because fire destroys tree folk. I mean, there's a there's a card from Lorwyn that specifically is about setting tree folk on fire. I can't remember the name of it, but I remember the flavor of it. So to me, this could have been so much more. This could have been a dryad who watched their, their grove burned down and bonded with the tree folk to have a bigger body to go and wreak havoc. It could be a dryad that's driven insane by having fire magic fused into it and now is just on a rampage. There's so much flavor. There's so much story that can be done with this red and six. And it's just like six is the sixth tree is the sixth tree folk. The sixth tree folk of what? That's the most nondescriptive nonsense of all. The guy would have been better off not really saying anything because his description was frustratingly dreadful. It really was. Like, it left me angry after I read it. I'm like, this is what you're going to do with the spoiler card? He has a big, long article where he talks about potential uses for it, and that's fine. That's what a lot of people seem to do. Talk about the strategy and everything. But I'm a flavor guy. I want to know the flavor behind this. Why is Ren bound into the six tree folk? What happened to the other five tree folk? Were they burned up by Ren and six? Is six voluntarily helping Ren, or has Six been subsumed? Has Ren taken over Six like a parasite? Is Did did Six offer up its, its body for Ren to take because Ren was dying? There's so many different things this could be, and it aggravates me to not know. But the artwork is pretty dope, and I like seeing it from a different angle than we saw in Planebound Accomplice. On Planebound Accomplice, you see it from the front, here we see it from the side, and you definitely get to see far more of the whole fire aspect infused. And you can see that the tree folk's body like mimics the movements 
of Ren. So they, they, they probably have some kind of symbiotic relationship there where it's like, uh, like when I move, you move as opposed, because the arm positioning makes it look like it's exactly the same as Ren's arms. So I'm guessing that six has been subsumed and has no actual control over the situation, which is kind of, kind of unfortunate, but at the same time, also kind of interesting. Now, that's all the spoiler cards. That's all the cards we have for today's set review. We'll be back tomorrow with more. At this point, it's time to roll the golden scroll. The people who are awesome enough to support my channel on Patreon or through channel memberships. Speaking of channel memberships, we're welcoming a brand new member, Path to Exile Podcast. Thank you very much for joining my channel membership. Glad to have you aboard. And I also want to give a special little shout out to Rebecca Heinrich for going ahead and increasing her Patreon pledge. Thank you very much for increasing your support and showing how much you value what I do. It makes me feel really nice. After we've got that out of the way, it's time to say to everyone, thanks for coming by. And for now, I'm history, baby.